Ada, have you seen Blue? Blue, there you are. Oh. You know, a lot of people have been wondering about you. They know you're a dinosaur, but they're not really sure what kind yet. So what do you say? Think we can figure this out? <coughs> wow! Did you see that? I think Blue wants us to follow. Blue skidoo, we can too. Oh wow! Look at all these groups. But how do we know which you belong to? A clue, a clue. I see, so that means you're an early theropod. A clue, a clue. Oh, so you're a cousin to the sauropods then? A clue, a clue. Neither, but. A clue, a clue, a clue, a clue, you might ask, when you look at this and say, oh, a dinosaur, and then look closer and notice all the odd little details that are not what you would normally expect to see in a dinosaur. The answer is that this is supposed to be a Herrerasaurus, and even though the toy is wrong, it does somewhat accurately portray that dinosaurs were still figuring out how to be dinosaurs at this stage. Now, mind you, this toy is portraying them as sort of a half-crocodile goblin that's only just now figuring out this whole bipedalism thing, and that is not the case. These were agile, athletic bipeds, the first large-bodied bipedal carnivores to be really successful in the dinosaur clade. But, uh, as we'll see, successes don't always endure. Herrerasaurus is from the Ischigolasto Formation in northwestern Argentina. These are Carnian rocks, or possibly very early Estenorian, right around 229 to 227 million years ago. At the time that this animal lived, that area was a rift basin. It was part of a series of rift basins that were opening up. It was an alluvial valley where both winds and waters were depositing sediments, with the consequence that some assemblages of animals are attritional, where they were washed all together after they had died over the course of months, and some mass mortality, either because there was a drought, or because when the rains came, they came in a torrent, or from volcanism. More on that later. The practical upshot of that is that the environment was more xeric than previous or subsequent zones. The, the humidity was lower. There were only seasonal rains. There was a distinct dry season and a wet season. As with pretty much every Triassic dinosaur, Herrerasaurus is very important to the evolution of dinosaurs. Or rather, I should say, it's very important to our human understanding of the evolution of dinosaurs. Herrerasaurus were just doing their own thing. They didn't know that they were inventing the mid-sized theropod niche, even though they might not be theropods. Uh, Work on Herrerasaurus kind of falls into the same trap that work on Archaeopteryx does, where workers are as much, sometimes more, concerned with what this means for our cladistic analysis, and not so much Herrerasaurus for its own sake. Though that is changing. The type specimen was discovered in 1961 on the third of four expeditions led by Osvaldo Rega and Jose Bonaparte. You knew he was going to show up because we're talking about Argentina, but you didn't know it was going to be this early. It was described and named by Rega in 1963. The genus name comes from one Victorino Herrera, who was a local artisan and rancher, and is the person who actually found the type specimen which is the rear half of an articulated skeleton. The type is missing the middle portion of the tail. We only have the base and the tip, but even having to reconstruct the entire thing, it's got to be longer than this toy is portraying it. We know that at the base of the tail, the neural spines on the vertebrae are straight up. They're vertical, whereas every other basal dinosaur has them raked back. So Herrerasaurus had the plesiomorphic condition, the ancestral condition. At the tail tip, in the distal portion, the prezygapophyses, which are those fingers of bone that articulate with the previous vertebra, are long and low. It's an adaptation for bipedalism. It lets them 
hold the tail up. It lets them maneuver the tail more easily. I don't know how you'd represent that in a toy, but it's neat. This toy's torso is slightly too short, I think. Herrerasaurus has that quality that a lot of early dinosaurs do, where at a glance, it seems like the front of the animal is kind of long for the back half of the animal to be balancing. Obviously it did, but it just like looks that way. There's a bunch of quirks of its spine that I don't have explanations for, but they are interesting. The rear dorsal vertebrae, the, the, the backbones right in front of the hip, are all compressed front to back. And the larger the Herrerasaurus, the larger the individual, the more compressed they are. The neural spines on the vertebrae have these grooves on the front and back of them. And then on the top of them, they have these lips. They have, they have like a, a rim around the entire top of the neural spine. Again, don't know why, but because those vertebrae at the front of the hip were short for Ostracodily, the, the hip, despite itself being rather short, covered like five vertebrae. Herrerasaurus's hips were big and wide and robust and quite different from other basal dinosaurs' hips. Other basal dinosaurs had the ancestral archosaur condition, which is to have the ribs that are connecting the backbone to the blades of the hip be high and flat. And they, all of them had at least three sacral vertebrae, usually more. Whereas Herrerasaurus has just two, doing the work of three to five. And they have these ribs connecting them to the rest of the hip that are really deep top to bottom. Functionally, it's quite similar to a theropod hip, except for being really wide. So apparently whatever selection pressure was causing theropods to make their hips really pinch together didn't apply to Herrerasaurus. Not that it is without derived traits in the hip. The pubis, which you can kind of see in this toy, it's this bump in between the legs. Maybe it's easier to see from this side. This bump in between the legs is where the pubis is supposed to be. And Herrerasaurus's pubis was somewhat retroverted. It's, it's what's called mesopubic, where it's pointing basically straight down. And it had a really large pubic boot. Both of those are traits that show up in theropods, but we don't exactly know why. There are important muscles that attach to the pubis that are used for walking and for breathing, but other close relatives of Herrerasaurus don't have their pubis moved backwards and don't have a large boot on it, and they were presumably walking and breathing the same way that Herrerasaurus was. So that leaves maybe something to do with its egg morphology, or something to do with its nesting behavior, or maybe it just habitually liked to sit down in a particular way and that bone was useful there and not further forward. Speaking of the way that they walked, I'm gonna regret saying this, but they walked like dinosaurs. Their ankles were somewhat intermediate between the ancestral dinosaur condition and what we see in more derived animals, but they very clearly had the, the, the two main bones of the ankle, the astragalus and the calcanum, functioning as one unit. They weren't fused together, but the whole foot pivoted against that hinge. That's different from what we see in ancestral archosaurs, where the whole foot can pivot as a hinge, but it can also rotate on axis. Because Herrerasaurus was entirely parasagittal, it was entirely walking with its feet underneath it, it didn't need the ability to switch how its ankle worked. And having its ankle function as one immobile unit on the end of its tibia means that it was better able to bear the stresses of walking completely upright. As for the feet they were walking on, this toy broadly has the right idea, except that the feet are way too big. The middle three toes were indeed the largest toes, but the third would be longer than the other two, the fourth would be nearly so long, and the second would be shorter than the fourth. The claws... this toy has the right idea, where they're flat on the bottom and triangular in cross-section. They're sort of these pyramids. They're not for clawing at things. They're not sharply recurved. So maybe this toy could get away with being a little more straight out than they are. Now, as you can see on the toy, they did in fact have both the first and fifth toe present. 
The first toe was probably longer than this. It, it may have touched the ground, but it doesn't seem to have been for walking on. The fifth toe, I'm not sure if it was vestigial. There's a related animal called Nathavorax, which has three toe bones attached to the fifth foot bone, whereas Herrerasaurus only has one, and we don't exactly know how long it was. So maybe it was just important to the function of the rest of the foot, but it was basically tucked away behind the fourth foot bone. I'm not sure if you would see it from the outside as a distinct element like they've portrayed it on this toy. There's also, it's difficult to see, but there appears to be just like a little dot of an ungual on the fifth toe of this toy, and that does not seem to be the case. The, the single toe bone that we have is, is clearly not a claw bone. Based on muscle and ligament attachments on the leg bones, as well as just the sheer size of the hip bones, we would expect that Herrerasaurus would have muscular legs, but this toy is taking things a bit far. These are, these are quite oversized thighs on this toy. The ratio of the length of the femur to the length of the lower leg, compared to derived theropods, suggests that Herrerasaurus was a comparatively poor runner. But among the large-sized animals in that data set, Tyrannosaurus kind of completely destroyed the grading curve. Compared to its contemporaries, it was plenty fast, it would seem. The reason for this is that having a longer lower leg relative to your femur correlates to having a longer stride, and the longer your stride, the faster you can run. I skipped ahead for some of that. Uh, we had more material to work with starting in the 90s, and workers, particularly Fernando Novas, clarified a lot of what we had for the type and were able to, for example, fill in some of the details of the ankle and the feet that weren't really well preserved in the type. Speaking of which, it turns out that in 1958, a Harvard expedition led by Romer had actually found a Herrerasaurus skull. But they didn't know that it was a Herrerasaurus skull because we didn't have a what's called a bridging specimen until the 90s. We didn't have a specimen that had both the skull of Herrerasaurus and bones that corresponded to bones in the type. In the 80s, that skull was referred to Storicosaurus, which is a similar animal from the Carnian of Brazil, but they weren't confident assigning it to a particular species or naming a new species. The skull is not really well preserved. Oh, also there's some postcranial fragments. It's all covered over with calcite, so I'm not sure whether those fragments would have really clarified too much with Herrerasaurus. Especially considering that now we have a skull and its relationships are still unstable. Depending on the paper, Herrerasaurus shakes out as either a early branching theropod, an early branching sauriscian, or an early branching dinosaur. Historically, it's also been regarded as an early branching sauropodomorph, but that affinity, other than a brief blip in 2017, has not stood the test of time. Which result you get largely depends on the data set you're using for your analysis, which sounds like a tautology, but I'm trying to underscore the profound lack of clarity on these high-level dinosaur relationships which is confounded by the fact that Herrerasaurus itself has this mosaic of sauropod, theropod, basal dinosaur, and its own unique characteristics. Those first two were apparent pretty early. In 1963, Rega described Herrerasaurus and Ischisaurus, which is another Ischibulasto Herrerasaurid, as carnosaurs, but at the time that just meant large-bodied carnivorous dinosaur. It was a couple of years later that workers started to notice that, hey, mixed in with these Carnosaur characters are similarities to animals like Platyosaurus, which at the time were called Prosauropods. In 1966, Romer explicitly put Herrerasaurus in the Prosauropods as a close relative of Platyosaurus, but in 1970, Bonaparte questioned that. He considered it possible that Herrerasaurus and Storicosaurus, remember them, uh, were just early diverging dinosaurs, just primitive saurischians. We would use the term basal. It seems that anytime workers pull too hard at the threads of saurischia, herrerasaurids pop out of theropods and land somewhere else. That happened in 1978, 
when Van Heerden, for some reason, decided that platyosaurids were actually the ancestors of theropods, which made hererosaurids the ancestral sauropods. I've been saying hererosaurid a lot, I should probably define what that is. That just means hererosaurus and its closest relatives. This group has usually, but not always, included Storicosaurus. It did in 1973 when Benedetto erected the group. Uh, he found them to be basal theropods, if you're keeping score, I'm not. Today, as of 2019, the, the uncontroversial Herrerasaurids are Storicosaurus, in a basal position, Herrerasaurus, San Juansaurus, which is another East Uvalasto Herrerasaurid, described in 2010, and Nafavorax, which was just described a couple of years ago in 2019 from the Carnian of Brazil. There are some other candidates that have shown up in Herrerasaurids from time to time. Um, Tawa, Demonosaurus, and Chindesaurus, which are all from the late Triassic of Arizona, are currently, as of 2021, found to be late surviving non Herrerasaurid Herrerasaurian which is perfectly not confusing. If you want to know where Rega's Ischisaurus fits into that, it and another genus from Ischigolasto called Fringuellosaurus were both known from fairly incomplete remains, and once we got more complete specimens of Herrerasaurus, we were able to say, oh, these are just Herrerasaurus of wildly different sizes. Ischisaurus is pretty small, but Fringuellosaurus, which is specimen uh, 53, is the largest specimen of Herrerasaurus we have found. This puts the overall size of the genus somewhere at the 4 to 5 meter mark, which is 13 to 16 feet. Um, mass is fraught to estimate, but something like a quarter ton seems reasonable. Now, you may be wondering, are the little specimens just younger animals and the larger specimens older animals? I wonder that as well, because I couldn't find any work on the ontogeny of Herrerasaurus. Ordinarily, we would look at whether certain bones have been fused together because the seams between them disappear as the animal ages. Alternatively, you can cut into bones and look at the lines of arrested growth. It's similar to looking at tree rings. If the lines of arrested growth near the outside of the bone are really closely spaced, you know that the animal has slowed way down in its growth, which usually means it's reached adult size. The reason that we want to look for evidence like that in Herrerasaurus, instead of just assuming that the small ones are younger, is that basal dinosaurs retained this quality called um, developmental plasticity, which means that as the animal is growing, if food is abundant, it will grow faster and just reach a absolutely larger adult size. In Platyosaurus, we have some individuals that are twice the size of other individuals the same age. So maybe Herrerasaurus had a situation like that going on and all of the specimens we have are adults, or maybe some of them are juveniles. I do not know. But Herrerasaurus is the largest of the Herrerasaurids, assuming Fringuellosaurus is indeed Herrerasaurus, which would also make it the largest known carnivorous Triassic dinosaur, not the largest Triassic carnivore. There was no shortage of carnivores at East Ugolasto. I already mentioned San Juansaurus, which is the other valid Herrerasaurid from the formation. There was also Pelorocephalus, which was a big, well, medium-sized temnospondyl amphibian. You've seen these guys. They, they look like giant salamanders with a big triangular head on them, even though they might not actually be closely related to salamanders. There was Proterochampsa, which was a non archosaur Cloritarsin, but it physically, and we presume ecologically, closely resembled living crocodiles. It's one of several times that reptiles have evolved a crocodile-like bowplon, but those are both pretty small. The largest carnivore at Istugulasto was Saurosuchus, which is more closely related to crocodiles than Proterochampsa, but ironically doesn't really resemble them. This was a large, quadrupedal, deep-skulled carnivore that lived on land and walked upright. Size estimates for Saurosuchus vary because the remains are not very complete. The smallest estimates put it slightly bigger than the largest known Herrerasaurus, but the largest estimates are twice that size. Clearly, they were the apex predators in their environment, even though they were dramatically outnumbered by Herrerasaurus. Saurosuchus is actually one of the suspects in a mystery. 
We have some paleopathologies in uh, PVSJ407, a skull of Herrerasaurus, where there's three puncture wounds to the left side of the head. There's two in the jaw and one in the back of the top of the head. And weirdly, if these are bite wounds, and the authors think they are, they're coming from three different directions, which is kind of weird because if the aggressor, which in this case is a time-traveling Tyrannosaurus Rex, had Herrerasaurus's face in its mouth, you would expect it, actually it was the left side, you would expect to find puncture wounds going up into the jaw and puncture wounds corresponding to that down into the top of the snout. But that didn't happen, so I guess the aggressor just like bounced Herrerasaurus's head in its mouth three times and then Herrerasaurus got away? And we do know that it got away because the pathologies healed. Despite leaving marks on the bone, uh, and despite having an initial infection, the bones healed and new, new bone was deposited around the puncture marks. The authors think that the aggressor could have been a Saurosuchus, based on the fact that that's the only animal at Ustugulasta that's large enough to fit Herrerasaurus' head in its mouth. Um, though I feel like Specimen 53 could maybe fit 407s in its mouth. I'm not sure, though. Alternatively, they consider that since 407 got away, that means it might not have been a predation attempt. It might have been just an intraspecific dispute. When did we get a skull, you ask? Well, workers haven't stopped going to East Jubilasto. In 1988 and 1991, there were a pair of joint Argentine-American expeditions with some names that we're going to continue seeing in the citation boxes. Paul Sereno was there, Fernando Novas was there, uh, El Cobert, Martinez, uh, Bonaparte was there, for a couple days at least, uh, and they had a Herrera. Uh, Victorino could not go, but they had his nephew acting as a mechanic and guide, uh, and one presumes good luck charm, which seems to have worked because they recovered a lot of material. The most famous find from these expeditions is probably Aoraptor, but they also found a couple, at least, articulated Herrerasaurus specimens which meant that, starting in the 90s, we had detailed descriptions of its osteology coming out. These were the first complete look at such an early dinosaur, and they revised a lot of what we thought about what the ancestral dinosaur characters were. Consequently, we had to revise a lot of our ideas about the high-level relationships, and that's basically what we've kept doing for 30 years. Generally speaking, analyses which recover the Ornithoscelida hypothesis, where Ornithischians are the closest relatives to theropods, find Herrerasaurids to be basal dinosaurs, whereas studies that recover the traditional Saurischia, where sauropods are the closest relatives to theropods, recover Herrerasaurids as basal members of that group. The most recent analysis of Triassic animals that I've seen in 2021 recovered them in that position as basal Sauriscians, but the authors emphasize the lack of consensus on this, which I'm repeating because by the time this episode goes up there's probably going to be another paper with a different topology. But as I said, starting in the 90s we had a complete picture of their anatomy, including the front half. So let's talk about the arms. These arms, at first glance, appear to be pretty scrawny. But I think that's just because they're next to these He-Man-level muscular thighs. Um, Herrerasaurus's arms, based on the prominence of the attachment points for tendons and muscles, seem to have been pretty muscular. And simply because of the ratio of the length of the humerus to the forearm to the hand, they had a lot of mechanical advantage using their arms for grasping and as weapons. It seems like this toy's pectoral girdle, the, the, where the shoulders meet the torso, uh, is scrunched. I think it should be wider than this. In reconstructed skeletons, you see the front of the rib cage being about the width of the hip. You only see that in reconstructions because the ribs we have are all pretty fragmentary. We don't exactly know what shape the rib cage of Herrerasaurus was. The arms and hands on this toy are approximately the appropriate length, though the fingers are entirely too wide. The claws on the ends of the fingers are probably too small for once. Um, like theropod claws, they were narrow and strongly recurved, and on Herrerasaurus they were quite big. You'll notice on the toy that the third finger is actually the longest, and surprisingly that's accurate. In, in theropods you usually see the second finger is the longest, or, or maybe the second and third fingers are equal. But in Herrerasaurus the third finger is the longest. 
You can't tell on the toy, which as far as I can tell is accurate, but the fourth and fifth fingers are actually present as bones probably entirely encased within the hand. But the fourth finger at least still has a finger bone attached to it, so I can't call them vestigial. Like, they still articulate with the wrist, so maybe they were important to the function of the hand in some way. Because they had such long fingers, especially the, uh, the finger bone just before the claw, the penultimate phalanges, were quite long, that's geometrically just very useful if you're using your hand for grasping. And due to the shape of the hand bones where the fingers attach to them, whenever the fingers would flex or extend, they would push together. So fingers two and three would push into one another and sort of form one big claw between the two of them. This could be used to rake at a target, whether it's another Herrerasaurus or a prey animal. Uh, this would be helped by the fact that their fingers could extend nearly perpendicular to the hand. And I don't know why I'm trying to do that, because ours don't. We'll just do an animation. The hand attached to the wrist in kind of a unique way among dinosaurs. The wrist was somewhat double-jointed. It could hinge at two places to rotate inwards 45 degrees, as well as seemingly uh, invert and evert a little bit, which is where the hand moves in the plane of the forearm. That's kind of unique in dinosaurs because usually the hand is pretty rigidly attached to the forearm until you get to the, the paraves, until you get close to birds and they start to be able to fold their wing. But that's a completely different arrangement of wrist bones anyway. Clearly then, the hands were multi-purpose tools and weapons for goring at competitors or for grasping at prey. And there was plenty of prey to grasp at at Isuelasto, both herbivores and smaller carnivores. Despite the lack of trees, apparently we have very few woody plants. It was almost all herbaceous plants, and uh, plants without uh, uh, trunks or woody stems. The environment was supporting literally tons of herbivores. The most common of these by far was Hyperodapodon, which was a medium-sized rhynchosaur. They were incredibly common animals. They're sort of like a big herbivorous tuatara, if you can imagine that. They have unusually wide heads, is what strikes you when you look these guys up. But we also had a couple of very large stem mammals. There was a big cynodont that was pretty common called Exeratodon, and a giant tuskless dicynodont uh, called Ischigolastia. Confusingly, dicynodonts are not actually closely related to cynodonts. But other dicynodonts are reconstructed approximately like hippos ecologically, so I assume that's also the case for Ischigolastia. There was also Aetosauroides, which was a medium-sized basal Aetosaur. Aetosaurs are actually crocodile relatives, but they resemble nothing so much as a tiny ankylosaur, except they're not quite the right shape. But they're little herbivorous armored archosaurs in the Triassic. And we had Psilosuchus, which may have been the largest herbivore there. This was a archosaur, it's a group called the Shuvasaurids. They were bipedal, toothless, so probably beaked, herbivores. The type of Psilosuchus is actually smaller than Herrerasaurus, but isolated bones that were previously misidentified as Saurosuchus suggest that there were gigantic individuals something like 9 or 10 meters long. There were a number of smaller terrestrial animals. We have six or seven small to medium-sized dinosauromorphs, including basal dinosaurs. These are a mix of quadrupeds and bipeds, a mix of carnivores and herbivores and omnivores. The most famous of these are probably Pisanosaurus, which usually turns out as a basal ornithischian, and Aoraptor, which was the little carnivorous sauropodomorph. There are also two other animals rather similar to Aoraptor that also usually come up as basal sauropodomorphs. We have five or six smaller stem mammals. I think these are all eucynodonts, but these are like badger-sized carnivores. And there were two more non archosaurcuritarsins, but unlike Proterochampsa, these were terrestrial animals. They were alongside two more derived crocodile line archosaurs, and all of these were small to medium carnivores of some stripe. Most of these animals seem to be at the appropriate size for Herrerasaurus to come along and claw and or grasp at them. 
but it turns out that Herrerasaurus's skull also has adaptations for catching and holding. This toy's head is lengthwise, at least, about the right size for Herrerasaurus. They had surprisingly large heads for such early dinosaurs. This toy's neck appears to be about the appropriate length, too. We don't exactly know the length of Herrerasaurus's neck. None of our specimens preserve the transition from the base of the neck to the start of the torso. Novas assumed that they would have the ancestral origin to the Deeran condition, where they have nine cervical vertebrae, and it turns out that was a pretty safe assumption because Sanwansaurus and Nathavorax appear to both have nine anyway. So, despite having nine vertebrae, th the neck vertebrae are actually quite short, so the neck overall is shorter than you might expect. The neck on this toy is quite beefy, which I am fine with. The epipophyses on the, the top of the back of the neck vertebrae were prominent. The, these, are, these are those processes that extend out over the next vertebra. This shows up in large-headed theropods for the same reason. You, you have a large head, you need a muscular neck to move it around. That said, this toy has a weird curvature. The, it's, it's more of a A than an S, but that might just be the pose. It's kind of in like a stalking pose here. The head is actually pretty much a big wedge for once, though it wouldn't be nearly this wide. Uh, it's, it's not a perfect triangle. Um, the back of the skull would be wider than the area immediately in front of the eyes, so it's, it's, a, it's a slightly S-curved on each side skull, but the story has the right idea. The shape of the snout is about right as well, where it's pretty squared off though the jaw is a bit too deep. You shouldn't be able to see the temporal fenestrae so clearly, the, but since we can, we might as well critique them. The antorbital fenestra shouldn't be this long, it should be a little more oval-shaped, and the temporal fenestra shouldn't be this oval-shaped. It should be kind of a sloppy triangle with a narrow point at the top. And where are the ears? This animal doesn't appear to have any ears. There'd be holes at the, at the back of the head there. Herrerasaurus also has a small fenestra between the premaxilla and the maxilla, as well as the foramen that resembles the condition in Sorisciens below the nasal, but you, you're not going to see those on a toy because they'd be covered over with flesh. This toy has really enlarged nodules or tubercles over the eyes, forming these almost crests. As far as I know, that's reasonable, but they wouldn't be at this vertical and they wouldn't be this far back. The lacrimal bone, which is in front of the eye, is rugose and pitted, and it actually has these projections on it, but they're projecting sideways, which is odd because if you look at the skull from the front, they're kind of blocking the eye's ability to look straight forward. Maybe binocular vision wasn't actually that important to Herrerasaurus, or maybe it habitually just looked forward and down. I'm not sure but some kind of boss or keratin sheathed crest is not outside the realm of possibility there. We know that eyesight was of some importance to Rarosaurus because the description of Nathavorax in 2019 described the endocranium of that animal. So assuming that Herrerasaurus had something similar going on, the enlarged flocculus and paraflocular lobe imply that they had well-developed motor control of the eye and head. That's an adaptation for predation. It needs to be able to control its eye movements and its head movements and coordinate them to snap at prey. Final note on eyesight. This toy, as you can see, has slit pupils. Now, that's probably just to make it look like a Jurassic Park Velociraptor, or, you know, make it look like a, uh, a cat or a crocodile, make it look like a hunter, but as I said in Velociraptor, that we don't have a lot to go on as far as pupil shape in dinosaurs. Workers were able to use the fragments of the scleral ring that we have, as well as the morphology of the eye socket, to determine that they had mesopic eyes, which correlates to being a cathameral animal. So that's active whenever the opportunity presents itself probably sleeping during the heat of the day and during the cold of the night, but otherwise active whenever the prey is active. Now, if this animal was living and hunting in low light and bright light conditions, that could 
correlate to needing slit pupils. But there's another consideration that I didn't mention in Velociraptor, which is that living animals with slit pupils tend to be animals that hunt with their eyes close to a horizontal surface. In crocodiles or in black skimmers, that's the surface of the water. In tuataras or house cats or snakes, that's the surface of the ground. Velociraptor, pretty close to the ground. It's not a big animal. Herrerasaurus is a pretty big animal, so I don't know if they would have needed the extended depth of field on the horizontal plane that constricting your pupil that way gives you. I have repeatedly mentioned that this animal is a predator without talking about the teeth, so let's get to that. This toy actually has too many teeth for once. I don't know if we've ever had that before. Usually the level of detail when you're making a toy means that you have to skimp on the number of teeth, but this one, by my count, has 30 upper teeth, where it should have 21 or 22, and 20 lower teeth, where it should have 16. Now, when the mouth is closed, you probably wouldn't have the teeth poking out of the mouth. This is a weirdly divisive thing to say, but we have rows of nutrient foramina along the maxilla and dentary bones, and when the mouth is closed, the foramina on the dentary actually line up pretty perfectly with the tips of the upper teeth. That implies that they were supporting lizard-like lips. So when the mouth was closed, no exposed teeth. The model that they have at the Field Museum actually has a face that looks like this, and it looks nice. What more reason do you need? It looks nice. The teeth do indeed curve backwards. They are, they are recurved. They are narrow, recurved, and have serrations on the back edge. Actually, the maxillary teeth have serrations on the front edge as well. These are all adaptations for processing meat. They also show up in carnivorous theropods. The upper teeth at the front of the maxilla, so in front of the antarbital fenestra, were indeed the longest upper teeth. Um, it probably wouldn't be this nice, neat curve like this toy is portraying it. Teeth would vary in length between one another. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but this toy actually does have the teeth corresponding to that on the bottom be the longest teeth on the bottom. So the, the third through eighth teeth on the bottom would be significantly longer than the rest of them. Also accurate, the toy has the dentary teeth leave off well ahead of where the upper teeth leave off. That's because the dentary teeth stopped before the intramandibular joint. This joint is morphologically different, but functionally similar to a joint that shows up in a bunch of theropods, as well as a bunch of living lizards, like uh, Gila monsters have one. It allows the front of the jaw to hinge a little bit relative to the back of the jaw, in Herrerasaurus, by about 15 degrees. So having a double jointed jaw allows you to have a larger gape when your mouth is open and makes it easier to hold on to things when your jaw is closed. Though this does come at the expense of raw bite force, because there's no muscles directly attaching to the front of the jaw, it's all done with ligaments. Though because they're ligaments, that also might act as a sort of shock absorber for the lower teeth, so that they take less wear and tear and don't need to be replaced as often. And with this suite of adaptations to Carnivory, Herrerasaurus was clearly successful in its niche. Um, we have something like 58 individuals known from Istiguilasto. That is, that is a runaway success, which is kind of exceptional this early in the dinosaur radiation. Starting in the early 2000s, our understanding of the Triassic uh, underwent a bit of a shift. We kept finding late surviving non-dinosaur dinosauromorphs, or dinosauroforms, in the late Triassic. We'd previously thought that they all died out in the middle Triassic. And it seems that Ornithischians and Sauropodomorphs didn't really reach a global distribution in the Triassic. That didn't happen until the early Jurassic. See, when I was a kid, the broad narrative of the Triassic that I absorbed was that it was a slow but inevitable dinosaur takeover, because their only meaningful competition were these backwards relics that might as well be Permian animals. And that's not the case. 
dinosaurs were competing with one another and with a diverse and very capable array of non-dinosaurs. And the Triassic could have shaken out with dinosaurs less successful than they were. We know this because Herrerasaurus, despite distinguishing itself in this extremely crowded field that was Ischigolasto, wound up disappearing once that environment changed. Research in the 2010s and 2020s has underscored that Ischigolasto was incredibly diverse, but that earliest biozone is where most of our information is coming from. Then, once the environment changes, of the 25 or 6 genera that are known from that earliest biozone, only 4 re-emerge, and none of them are dinosaurs. This might be due to sampling or preservation bias. The, the subsequent environments at Ischigolasto were not as good at preserving animals in the first place, and a lot can happen to rock in the ensuing hundreds of millions of years. But Herrerasaurus and Hyperadapodon were incredibly common in the earliest biozone, and then they're just gone. Volcanism seems to have increased after Herrerasaurus's day, but whether that had a role in any extinctions that happened, or whether volcanism made life harder for the animals that stuck around is conjectural. If we zoom out and look at later dinosaur-dominated ecosystems, we see that the Herrerasaurids are gone there too. We have some late surviving Herrerasaurians, possibly, but the little carnivores are no longer sauropodomorphs. Those are all theropods. The mid-sized carnivores, also theropods. They were outcompeted by other dinosaurs. <laughs> the last question we have with regards to Herrerasaurus's life appearance is its integument, its skin. We see the conventional, traditional tubercule pavement on this toy. They've restored it with kind of larger nodules along the dorsal side of the animal, and then I presume this is representing like a finer pebbly texture here, but they didn't want to have the level of detail to sculpt every individual scale. I cannot tell you whether that is accurate. Ordinarily, we would try to bracket this. We would say that because its ancestor was scaly, it's probably scaly, unless we have compelling evidence to the contrary. But as I hope I have made clear, we don't really know what its phylogenetic bracket is with any, like, fine detailing. Since we can't do cladistics to the problem, we can look to other lines of evidence. Ideally, we would want some kind of direct evidence. We would want a skin impression that shows scales, or a specimen preserving filaments. We don't have that. Uh, we don't have that for Herrerasaurus or any animal close to Herrerasaurus. We could use biomechanical modeling. Workers have estimated that basal dinosaurs would have had uh, ratite-like metabolism, so similar to a modern ostrich, for example, uh, but a much broader range of core temperatures that they could operate at. So we can then calculate for the temperatures that this animal would be living in with that metabolism, with a body shaped the way that Herrerasaurus's body is, what would it need to do to maintain those core temperatures? Nobody's done that kind of analysis for Herrerasaurus, at least not that I could find, but I wish they would because there's a quirk of Istigolasta that I have not mentioned yet, which is that it was cold. It was, like, weirdly cool for the Triassic. Ischigolasto was further south in the Triassic than it is today. Today it's around the 30th parallel, whereas back then it was at around the 45th. But it was also at a lower elevation. It was only below a thousand meters, because the Andes as we know them hadn't formed yet. And the world was just warmer in the Triassic. There were no ice caps at the poles, and volcanism kept pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. So, Right before Ischigolasto, we actually had a global warming event. It was called the Carnian Pluvial Episode, because pluvial means rain. There was, there was increased humidity, increased rainfall, and increased temperatures. The underlying formation of Ischigolasto is the Los Rastros Formation, and workers calculated that the temperatures there would have been between 15 degrees Celsius and 35 degrees Celsius, which is uh, maxing out at like 96 degrees Fahrenheit for the Americans. It's quite hot. But then, at Ischigolasto, the temperature is maxing out at like 11 degrees Celsius, which is uh, 52 degrees Fahrenheit. We get these temperatures by 
I, I don't totally understand it because I'm not a geologist, but you can look at the isotopes of oxygen in calcite and the oxygen and hydrogen isotopes in gertite and use that to calculate the temperature of the water when those crystals formed, which then gives you a ballpark for what the air temperature was. And I still see that 11 degrees Celsius figure cited uh, as of 2020, so I assume nobody has any real problem with it, which means that at Estrigolasto we had a few million years of cool, arid, seasonal rains, like a throwback to an earlier period of the Triassic, and then two meters of pink tuff due to volcanism, and then the humid southwestern Pyongean climate returned. If Herrerasaurus was living in that cold of temperatures, might it have needed some kind of fluffy integument to keep it warm? Not sure. We can look at other animals, however, every statement we make comes with a big butt in the middle of it. Workers modeled a Coelophysis living in similar temperatures to what we see at Estrigolasto, using the method I outlined a second ago, and they found that if it was living at those temperatures, it would absolutely need fluff to survive. But even the most unrealistic chonker of a Coelophysis that they modeled was still smaller than the smallest uh, Herrerasaurus we have, and Coelophysis is already like just by the shape of its body, adapted to a much warmer climate. Whereas Herrerasaurus has this big heat-retaining barrel of a torso. If we look to the Cretaceous, there is an animal called Euteranus, which is from a formation that has similar temperatures, right around 10 degrees Celsius, and they're twice the size of Herrerasaurus and have long filaments over most of their body. But Euteranus is a Silurosaur, and Silurosaurs are pretty uncontroversially an ancestrally fuzzy clade, whereas everything about Herrerasaurus's clade is controversial. That was a very long way of saying, we don't know. Make a fuzzy Herrerasaurus toy. Make a scaly Herrerasaurus toy. Somebody's gonna tell you you're wrong, but it's not gonna be me. Yet. We here at Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong have not spent as much time in the Triassic as we probably should have. It is a fascinating period. Dinosaurs were just one group among many, and life was evolving all of these really unfamiliar forms. And no one animal will ever answer all of our questions about what dinosaurs were doing in that milieu, and it's kind of unfair to Herrerasaurus that for a while there we were asking it to. It was not the prototype dinosaur. It, it was adapted to its way of life the way any other animal would be. And I want to thank you for watching Your Dinosaurs Are Wrong. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will see you next time. We would like to extend a special thank you to these individuals who have gone above and beyond to support this show. We could not have done it without you. Thank you.